All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, good morning to any of you who are on the America's side of the globe. Um, and happy St. Patrick's Day uh, to those of you who think that drinking green beer is a natural human activity. Today's your day. Um, so I'm Chet Ensign. I am the uh, community standards or community development steward at Oasis. I, I work with our technical communities to help them work within the uh, the foundation's framework and uh, develop standards and increasingly open source projects um, in pursuit of uh, in interoperability in um, global communications. And uh, today I want to talk about open standards, uh, what those are, how they complement open source projects, and how the two can work together uh, in, a, in a virtuous circle of, of mutual improvement. Um, real quickly, I'll go over who, who is OASIS, um, what open standards are, how they relate to open source, uh, the value that a foundation can bring to a project um, that um, wants to pursue this course of action, and a little bit on what OASIS is doing to support that kind of collaboration. So real quickly, who is OASIS? Well, we are a, uh, a nonprofit Standards, organ, uh, standards development organization. We've been, uh, we, we've started in 1993. Uh, so we've been around for a long time. Um, you, uh, you may not know the name Oasis, but I'm betting you've probably run across some of our, uh, some of our standards. Uh, SAML, the security assertion markup language. Um, Exactmal, uh, the extendable access control language. Uh, CAP, Common Alerting Protocol, which underlies almost every single emergency alerting system uh, running globally. Um, so we have a broad we have a broad um, agenda, a, a broad technical agenda uh, from everything from cybersecurity to legal AI. Uh, it's, it's 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 broad because we let the members set the technical goals. We don't set the technical goals and then tell who. It, can come in and who can't, we, uh, we leave it to them to, to run it. Um, and we try to provide the level playing field where groups can work together in an uh, open, transparent, uh, and, uh, and fairly lightweight process to go through the steps of developing and improving uh, work. Uh, we also have uh, standards. Uh, we have uh, accreditation and liaison relationships with a number of other uh, organizations. And so uh, many of our standards have gone on to be ratified by ISO, ITU, etc. Here's the wall of logos. Lots of names you know there. Uh, we have about 2,000 members uh, as of now, uh, working on about 60 some odd projects. So open standards, what are they? What the heck do we mean by that? Well, when, when we say an, a standard is open, um, I think of it from two aspects. Uh, one of them is how is it developed? Uh, is it developed in a, in, in a transparent, even-handed process that anyone can participate in? And how is it offered? Is it available for use in an unencumbered ma uh, manner? So in terms of what does that process look like, uh, I like the, uh, the ANSI essential requirements. We're uh, accredited with ANSI, which is the uh, U.S. National Standards uh, Representative Organization to, uh, to ISO. And they define, uh, you, you basically have to prove that you do all of these things in order to be accredited with them. And they define open standards as, first of all, being open to all parties. Uh, no bouncers at the door. Uh, if you show up with a, uh, with a birthday present, you know, for the birthday girl, you get in. Um, lack of dominance. Yeah. And by lack of dominance, I don't mean somebody can't dominate because there's always people who are going to work harder and show up more often and will tend to, uh, tend to have more influence. But you make sure that there are mechanisms in place to prevent anybody from grabbing and maintaining documents. You've got to have a, you've got to have a process that, that enables that. Um, a balance of interests. You haven't left out consumers. You haven't left out vendors. You try to bring them all together and you look to get as broad a, a coalition of, of participants as you can. Um, visibility and notice. It's, it's got to work out. It's got to be done out where people can see what you're doing um, and you provide channels for feedback. Formal consensus mechanisms, which is uh, somewhat different from open 
open source projects. And I think lastly, and this is one of the benefits foundations can bring to, uh, to uh, open source projects, procedures, processes, protocols that are written and enforced. Um, it's one thing to say that a you know, supermajority vote has to be met uh, in order to approve uh, this, this draft as a specification. Uh, it's another thing to be able to say, yep, they held that vote and here's a pointer to the, uh, to the ballot uh, so that you can prove it later. Uh, you've got to follow the procedure you say you follow. Now on the other side, what is an open standard um, from its, uh, its offering point of view? It's, uh, is, it, is it available for, for use? Uh, well, our friends at the uh, OSI uh, have developed what they call open standards requirements of what they consider to be critical in terms of that availability. Um, and their list is no intentional secrets, no gotchas, no you've implemented 40% of the project and you suddenly get to the click box that says, you know, check here to get our special super secret license, which, uh, you know, is, is going for a special today. Um, there's got to be a process for reporting flaws and fixing them. Uh, it's got to be freely and publicly available. Uh, if you go to the, uh, the OASIS website, um, you can get to any of our specifications and just download them and use them. And there's a big notice section that says, here, take this thing and run with it. Um, any patents that apply to the work have either got to be licensed, royalty-free, no restrictions, or covered by a non-assertion promise. Uh, we're finding a non-assertion promise basically being Everybody who contributes says, hey, we might have patents, don't even know. If we do, we won't, we won't require licenses from them. And um, more and more of our projects uh, over the past several years have opted for the non-assertion um, covenant uh, because it just makes life easier. You don't, have to, you don't have to have technical people running back, to, back and forth to the lawyer's office saying, is this okay, is this okay, is this okay? Um, there must be no extraneous requirements gating the implementation. In other words, nothing else that you have to do other than download the thing and implement it. And then lastly, of course, no OSR incompatible dependencies. So great that you got this standard and you start working on it and suddenly you find you've got to also go pull in these three other ones and they all have royalties attached to them. So, so I think work that can, uh, that can meet both those stacks of criteria that's what we mean when we say open standards. And, you know, what is, what is their value and, and, and what do they bring to the table that is different from open source? Uh, well, I like to think of standards as, as being essentially contracts. Uh, you know, the documented consensus on how we're going to uh, fix a particular problem. You know, because at the end of the day, uh, open source projects and open standards projects both have the same goals. And this is one of the things that we've realized and we're trying to, to support. You want to make some, you want to fix a problem. You know, you want to make something happen. Um, the approach is different, um, but the goals are, are the same. And on the standard side, uh, one of the with a few of the things that I think are, are really valuable is, is first of all, they're a way of, of saving people from solving the same problem over and over again. Um, and they let communities identify the commodity processes that they need so that they can build unique products on top of it with their own unique expertise. Uh, one of our standards is AMQP, Advanced uh, Message Queuing Protocol. And, um, uh, and it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a, a business uh, uh, level communications uh, uh, standard uh, that was started because one of, the, one of the people in one of the financial services firms um, noticed that every time his team went into a new client to build a new, um, uh, to build a new uh, application, um, they had to build a communications layer. They had to, they, they, they had to figure out how to talk to the wire. Um, and they were doing that over and over again. And he said, why are we doing this? Why are we wasting time on this? this is, we're not making any money off this. We're not making money on what we build on top of it. So they, uh, they put together a... Um, uh, a protocol they called AMQP. And interestingly, because it's, this, is, this is sort of what we've been seeing, they started it as an open source project. And when they got it to a stage where they felt it was really stage one, that was the point at which they came to Oasis and said, hey, we want to turn this into a standard. Um, 
But that was what the standard does. It provides a uh, it provides a solution to a common problem, so that people who need that communications protocol can just write it once and then and then move on from there. Um, uh, because it does that, it shortens the time that, that it takes to build products. Uh, and it, interestingly, it, 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 one of the things we also see is that it the, the standards can enable applications that people didn't envision couldn't couldn't envision before uh, before that that was there um, uh, one of one of our uh, oasis standards is sticks the structured threat information expression standard it's basically a standard way to describe cyber attacks cyber events of some sort or another and uh, it was developed uh, initially uh, in the US government um, it was brought to Oasis in order to, to standardize it. And it's now the dominant way in which um, uh, cyber products are, when they, when they need to describe some sort of a cyber event, be it an intrusion, be it some response, what have you, they've got this language that they can use and people are using it more and more. And what happened was once, they, once the community started to realize, hey, we've got this, this working language for describing these things, they started saying, well, if we've got that, then we can get this application and this application cross-referencing with each other, and we can build a new capability off of that. Um, and standards help encourage that sort of development. Um, at Oasis, the synergies go back a long way. Um, we've found over the years that, um, uh, that um, the standards development process naturally either led to or emerged from open source projects. Uh, sometimes the standard has started, has, has come first. Uh, universal business language, which started at Oasis in 2001 as a way to uh, uh, basically create a, a, a standard vocabulary for business communications uh, to support e-commerce. So anything from an invoice to a tax and trade attestation to a bill of lading, um, they came up with standard language for that uh, it was very quickly picked up, particularly in Europe, where it broadly uh, is, is adopted in e-commerce applications. And we found many, many, many people building open source products on top of, of that language. The language came first, the open source projects came later. Um, an opposite example is where the open source code starts first. And then, and then comes looking for documentation. Uh, in fact, when we started working on our uh, open projects initiative to give open source projects an entree, um, we had many people coming to us saying, well, geez, we wish you had this five years ago because we would have done that. Um, groups that have started as, uh, as, as um, uh, open source. And so and one example here is, which is a very successful version, Sun uh, developed the Star Office software as an open source uh, uh, business documents creation platform. Um, in 2002, they took the document format and they brought that to Oasis because they wanted to, to uh, standardize it. It was standardized as the open document or ODF um, uh, standard, went on to be ratified as an ISO standard and it became the foundation for um, uh, other, other similar uh, uh, products, LibreOffice and OpenOffice, which both operate off of it. And interestingly now, the uh, Microsoft Office suite also supports the ODF standard. So that was a case of, of code first, document second. And then of course, many of them now they are in, they, 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 they quickly get into a cycle of, of virtuous mutual support um, MQTT came from IBM, where it was originally developed as a, as a communications protocol for satellites. Uh, but then this concept called the Internet of Things came up with lots and lots of tiny little sensors and doorbell cameras and, you know, um, smart uh, thermostats and what have you. And people looked around for a, a lightweight communications mechanism. And lo and behold, here was this thing that they were using for satellites. So it's been broadly adopted, uh, particularly since uh, they've expanded it with what they call SN, the sensor network uh, standard, the specification. But the interesting thing has been that there has been an open source project running parallel to it since the beginning. Uh, the PAHO project, which, which builds applications and incorporates MQTT. And the two of them, 
support each other with um, with requirements coming from PAHO and solutions coming back from the uh, from the TC. Um, plus, uh, I think it's really cool. I don't know of any other standards organization that uh, has, uh, has has got its logo on a race car. So just always like to throw that in. So what is the value of foundations uh, like Oasis in creating and supporting these sorts of ecosystems of, of, of collaboration and cooperation between open source and open standards? Um, well, what we've found is that by, by, by expanding, Oasis, Oasis has got a, a very mature uh, and widely accepted um, uh, process. Part of the reason we have the broad relationships that we have is because uh, people have vetted out our processes and they, uh, and they, they agree that, um, that, that we've got strong controls over, over, uh, over things like uh, IP and, um, and, and uh, uh, consensus agreements. Um, so we expanded that to a common governance for both the open source side and the open standards side uh, in order to uh, be able to deliver from both you know, the key capabilities that everybody's after, interoperability, choice, uh, and innovation. Um, so on the standard side, you've got strong IP management, you've got a lot of defining of the use cases up front uh, so that, you know, so that they're all documented at once and all addressed at once. And you've got formal consensus um, mechanisms. On the open source side, you've got uh, a, a, a looser uh, IP governance uh, um, uh, oversight. You've got iterative development cycles uh, that, that create use cases as they go. And, you know, rough consensus, lazy consensus, not, not as much. So by drafting rules that support both sides of this equation, we're able to give them the space to operate and interoperate together. Uh, one of the key aspects of this is neutrality. Um, and in, in some ways, this is not my favorite slide because it looks like the guy in the middle is pushing the two participants apart. In point of fact, what, 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 the, what this guy in the center does is bring people together and they do it through even handed rules to create a level playing field. That's our job. Our job is not to figure out who's right and who's wrong and what should be passed through and what should be stopped in its tracks. Our job is to say, here's how the game is played. Here's the level playing field. You can all come together. So no benevolent dictator for life, no, you know, big gorilla that owns the, uh, owns the thing and everybody else has to count out to them. Um, no animals more either than other. It's, it's neutrality of influence and direction. Um, the, you know, the, the project team has the expertise. This is one of the things that I say to people all the time. You, know, you guys have the expertise. I'll tell you how to handle the process and I'll, I'll work with you to make sure it gets, gets done, but I'm not going to get in the middle of your, if you tell me that this is the right solution, I trust you. So that's, that's, that, that's a key issue. Uh, another thing that's very important is that, um, uh, is that the foundation supports fairness. Um, and by fairness, I mean that there are procedures in place to make sure that things aren't done behind, you know, behind closed doors, um, that everyone has an opportunity to participate if they choose to exercise it. Um, that there are um, that there are guidelines and um, uh, and, and and protocols for um, uh, for for resolving differences of opinion and you know and and there's objection mechanisms. It's, it's all got to be in place, and it's all got to be consistently in, enforced. You know, it's sort of like the code of conduct that um, uh, that you know you see more and more in uh, open projects resources. And, and we've adopted one um, uh, that we use as, as our code of conduct for all of our, our processes. Um, uh, it's, it's there, it's, it's, it's gotta be something that everybody knows how to find, and there's gotta be mechanisms in it, uh, which is one of the key things you have to have. There's gotta be mechanisms in it so that it should, should there be violations, you've got a way to surface them and, and address them. And then lastly, and this one is near and dear to my heart because this is what my team does. Um, never underestimate the benefit 
that an experienced foundation can bring in terms of getting all of the uh, all, all of the operational stuff off your back so that you can focus on using your expertise and uh, you know and your skill set to uh, to advance your um, uh, your your specification your standard your code what whatever um, like I said we've been doing this since 1993 almost 30 years and uh, and uh, as a result we've both got a you know we, we've got we've got the operational foundations in place to support groups and we've got the experience in 30 years you can be sure somebody's thrown a hissy fit because they don't like the way this problem is being addressed by the rest of the tc and they want to make a big issue out of it and the chair is 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 looking for help in in resolving this in, in, internal conflict um uh you know it's it's it is I, I think a lot of times groups starting out, um, they don't really think about all of the framework that has to be in place in order to make sure that you produce a work product that can be accepted um, by uh, implementers uh, and, and used globally. Um, the, um, uh, the, the tendency is just to say, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll put in a license file. That'll be the end of that. Well, there's an awful lot of record keeping uh, and and uh, and and accounting and such that needs to go on to support to support a group, um, and there's a lot of value to having uh, experienced people who have been down the road uh, before, uh, so that when you run into a problem, you can go back to the, the foundation staff and say, "Hey, here's what's going on. Here's what we're having this problem with. Have you got any ideas to help?" Um, having that sort of backup can help you really spend more of your time on what you want to be doing, you know, be it the code, be it the standard, um, and, uh, and, and improving, uh, improving that and leave the mechanics to somebody else. <clears throat> so what has Oasis been doing in particular to support this? Well, as I said, almost from the beginning, we've had experience with open source projects. Um, we've, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've always found that there was a natural synergy between them. Uh, what we didn't have was a, uh, was a straightforward way to support those groups that wanted to come in with code first and then, uh, for the stuff that made sense, move on to, uh, to standardizing. Um, so we set up, uh, uh, an initiative that we announced in 2019 called open projects. And that's exactly what it's there to do. It's to provide the point of entree for a project that, that is developing open source code that knows that that's what it wants to do, but also knows or at least suspects that at some point they're going to want to document some of this stuff into, um, um, into, a, uh, into, a, into a, you know, an, a standard that can be uh, adopted, referenced, uh, uh, implemented um, you know, by, uh, by you know, multiple um, uh, adopters. And uh, so we started that pro uh, project and we did it by focusing on three elements of, of the, the puzzle. Uh, the first was governance. Um, you know, we took our existing standard and we simplified it and extended it so that it could be a governance model that um, uh, any open source project could use um, and would fit with sort of the open source way of doing things. Um, so the, the specification, uh, it, the, the governance rules lay out things like the record keeping requirements, the participation rules, um, the disclosure structures, what have you. Um, and they provide uh, light, clear, lightweight, but clear um, criteria for how you move work through, how you approve the work, um, uh, how it is, you know, how, how it is um, uh, um, uh, how, how the uh, the controlling uh, board oversees the project and, and governs it. So by taking our governance and making it work for both sides, we've made it possible for um, open source projects to come in and work successfully within within our organization. Um, on the uh, on the process flow side, again, our job <clears throat> excuse me our job is to be the neutral. Uh, you know, your referees, you know, the, the, the coaches and the neutral referees and let the project figure out the right way to work for its community. 
So we like to encourage a parallel uh, approach. We like to um, uh, we, we like to produce that. We like we like to encourage that sort of mutual synergy of of, of spec feeding into uh, code and code feeding back into spec. Um, but how that is done uh, up to the organizations, and we've got organizations that are doing it in all different kind of ways. Um, lastly, is uh, the the IPR. Um, and that is another area that, that is getting more and more attention as, uh, as projects start to uh, become more influential. Um, people are, are starting to say, well, wait a minute, you know, is it safe for me to use this? Is somebody going to come nail me with a, uh, with a license demand if I start implementing this? Uh, we have, have had for a number of years very strong um, IP um, structure on our standard side, and we took a similar kind of approach where uh, the open projects can choose from uh, seven uh, licenses that, uh, that, that we've identified as the sort of the, the, the best ones to use for this purpose. Uh, most of them are OSI sanctioned licenses. The Creative Commons uh, is in there, uh, mainly for documentation purposes. And that coupled with a non-assert covenant, which participants agreed to, it can it can provide the same kind of confidence to people and organizations that they can use, you know, this specification coming out of this group with confidence that uh, that that they're they're that, that they understand everything that's going to be required of them for using it. These are the current open projects that are underway. There, it's 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 pretty exciting work. Um, uh, the baseline is an Ethereum. Uh, community project, which is which is working on um, um, uh, making it easy for companies to accomplish um, um, uh, business goals on the main net um, uh, uh, with 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 confirmation, uh, you know that uh, um, that that uh, required uh, information is available, but without actually putting out proprietary information on the main net. Um, the Open Cybersecurity Alliance uh, is working on making uh, specifications and standards uh, and implementations to enable um, uh, interoperability between uh, different uh, cybersecurity tools. Um, this is uh, it's it's really exciting work, and uh, there's uh, there's several more that are in the pipeline that are going to be coming out uh, coming out uh, over the next couple of months, and we're really happy to see these projects taking off. Um, and proving that, in fact, getting this virtuous um, uh, life cycle between the open source and the open standards uh, is, is actually a, a viable uh, initiative. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I hope you found this interesting, and uh, I think I'll switch back over now and we can uh, see if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the interesting talk. Let me see if there are questions. I think there I already saw one. Um, ah, yeah, there it is. So the question is, um, uh, MQTT will be used in critical infrastructure. Is there any process to evaluate and improve security to avoid a mess like uh, Log4j using JNDI, which was never designed to be used this way. <laughs> there have been some interesting conversations about MQTT from exactly that, that perspective. Um, uh, the the uh, one, one of the things that I, I, I didn't I didn't mention in there, but uh, one of the key elements uh, of uh, the OASIS process and and the requirements that, that I went over is there has to be some way for people who are not part of the initiative to communicate back in be it needs, be it flaws. Um, so uh, every OASIS project has a channel for people to come in and say exactly that. You know, we, we, we've encountered this problem. Uh, and in fact, there was a, uh, early on, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a situation where somebody brought a, uh, a problem to the MQTTC and said, hey, we've, 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 we've discovered this hole you know, and um, uh, and they, they described it, presented it to them, and uh, the MQTTTC was able to do some documentation to to address it. So 
yes, in, in the case of MQTT and in the case of any other project, um, we've, we've got the channels available so that someone who is not an OASIS member and not a participant in the project can still provide information back in to identify flaws, to identify requirements, uh, to to um, you know to to give information back to the uh, the people who are actually doing the work. Okay, um, are there more questions? Uh, yeah, there's one. Um, have you ever seen standards being used to increase or promote Equity. Equity. Hmm. <laughs> to um, promote equity. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm not quite sure what 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 the uh, uh, what the questioner intends by equity, but um, uh, I, I maybe let, maybe should should have been equality. Well, oh, it, it was a typo. I'm I don't know. So, 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 uh, going back to that, um, you know, neutral, you know, neutral arbiter, uh, uh, you know, and um, uh, setting the, the level playing field. Um, uh, one of the key things, we, I, I mean, the, the reality is any initiative, whether it's an open source standard project or an open source project, there's going to be people who come in and they're going to, they're going to invest in the project. And they're naturally going to be more influential because they're spending more time, right? Um, uh, but uh, but but one of the things that we do with our with our with our governance procedures is make it possible for anybody to be, you know, in one of those one of those influential players. So you know, you don't have to be from you know an SAP or an Oracle or a Microsoft or an IBM or or, or what have you. Uh, in order to have influence in, in a project, um, uh, there are there are uh, it, it's it's set up so that um, uh, so that so that uh, we make it possible for people to um, um, be engaged. And there's also you know mechanisms for appeal and um, and objections. So that if somebody says, "Hey, wait a minute," you know they're trying to ram this through and this shouldn't be done there's mechanisms for them to bring that forward as well so we've tried to do as much as we can to level the playing field so that you know so that small um, organizations can have as much influence as big organizations if if that's what they really want to do